So good evening and uh, thank you for coming out. It's a great opportunity to see so many fellow citizens and people interested in our downtown area. And uh, again, thank you for being here and uh, we look forward to your import, input. Uh, you know, uh, we promised that we would have these meetings and listen to our, our, our people from the community. So I, before I turn it over to Mr. Bellis, I would like to introduce or recognize our County Commissioner Jim Fambro, who is in, uh, who is District One, who is part of the downtown area. So, thank you for being here, uh, Mr. Fambro. So, Mr. Bellis, uh, you know it is an informal meeting, so we're, you know, as council members, we'll be sitting down there with you guys, listening and taking notes, and and you know just being part of the crowd. So, uh, turn it over to Mr. Bellis, and I, I will. Uh, anything from the council? I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, I know you've got better things to do on a cold night, but you know it's always great to have public input. Uh, so that we uh, have an idea of how we're going to proceed this evening. Uh, I want to go through an agenda first. And uh, we want to give a, a Linda Perry, who's new uh, to the channel, relatively new, uh, who is uh, a, a great catch for the town. Um, she was the um, administrator for Eagle's Nest, uh, is now our uh, grants and revenue enhancement coordinator. And I wanted her to talk a little bit about the grants that she's working on uh, that involve the downtown. And most of them are oriented to planning. Uh, we're, I'm gonna ask the chief to talk a little bit about public safety the downtown just to tell you some of the things he's been doing working on he's got a couple of good meetings coming up along with the sheriff and some of the other law enforcement officials um, which hopefully you'll want to hear about those too and then some of the discussion points I know we can't cover in one night everything in the history of the downtown and all the problems that we're going to do. but there are a couple of things that have come up one of which was uh, certainly um, events and how that uh, we're, we're going to try to give you a calendar of events and a list of what so far, based historically on events in the past year and prior years, um, would require being on the plaza, closing a road, being a parade, being in the park, that kind of thing. And it's certainly not going to be all inclusive. There are things like Solar Fest. Um, uh, one of the things I already know we don't have on here is the Chamber of Commerce um, Thursday Night Live. I think we added that. I'm not too sure which version we have of, that we're going to show you. but. Uh, another couple of things, obviously the farmer's market, uh, there are people that have strong feelings both ways, and the council is committed to hear from the business community uh, as well as the residents before they move ahead on that for the coming year. Um, a couple of things that have come up, neon lights, uh, our current ordinance does not permit neon lights. Uh, it's a little slightly ambiguous as to whether it covers lights on the outside of the building and lights on the inside of the building if it can be seen from the outside. So before we went to enforce that, we want to talk about that a little bit uh, and get some clarification. Sandwich board signs on the sidewalks, general <coughs> signage issues that come up a lot. Uh, holiday decorations, um, a lot of people have asked, what is the status of Main Street, Arts and Culture District, the Historic District, how are they separate? Um, the idea of possibly, I know the Chamber has been involved a little bit. There are some other groups that have talked about a Downtown Business Association that rather than having large meetings like this on a regular basis could interface with the town council and the mayor to give input on uh, decisions on the downtown, uh, and whether there's interest in that, and any of your concerns, uh, you know, from potholes to, uh, trust me, I hear them all. Uh, sand in the alley, no sand in the alley, uh, whatever it is, but we're, we're here to hear those. And um, we, we do have a limited time tonight. Um, the council has got a full schedule coming up next week with meeting with uh, multiple state agencies, doing a strategic planning session, and a very long meeting on Tuesday. And I know that you know, you've got lives at home too. So this doesn't have to be the only meeting. And some of these things like the signs, uh, there are other groups that are gonna be working on that also, and other opportunities for people to refine that. So, uh, and then last, What's next? And what what does the council? What does everybody do with this information that we have here? What is the process going forward? So, um, 
with that, I'm going to ask Linda to come up here. <coughs> of the audience. I'm Linda Perry and um, Rick asked me just to do a brief overview of the grants that we've written or have received as they relate to the historic district. So um, the first one is an architectural walking map and um, this map will showcase the points of cultural historical significance within the Taos Plaza commercial district and surrounding neighborhoods all within the Taos historic overlay zone. This grant um, will be coming in very quickly and we have a due date of September 2015. So um, you should see that sometime over the summer. And I believe Rick isn't the second phase of this to put markers on the buildings as well that kind of has a little bit of history on each marker. So that's, that's sort of the phase one, phase two for this particular grant. The next one is a cultural landscape report of the historic Taos Plaza. Um, the cultural landscape report will cover the fields of historic landscape architecture, historic research, and natural resources. It will emphasize the plaza, including streetscapes, and integrate the previous restoration study of the old county courthouse. And again, this one will need to be completed by September. Um, this particular um, plan just helps management in the future in terms of uh, the physical attributions and um, how, you, how uh, you want to move forward with the plaza. The next one is a community forestry assistance grant. Um, this is the second phase as well. The first phase started off at Kit Carson Park where they did an inventory and assessment of trees and now it's, it's um, second phase is going into the historic district. We have started an urban forest management plan and with this grant we'll be able to complete that. And we also have a map of all the trees. And again, um, with this second phase, we'll be putting the trees in and identifying the trees that need to be replaced and when they need to be replaced. And Rick, if, if you want to jump in, if there's something that I'm leaving out, <laughs> please feel free to do so. The one thing I, I'm sorry, I've still got laryngitis and that whatever most people in town have. Um, but the one thing we do want to do is on all of these grants is particularly like the walking maps and everything, is that we want to create the base. So these are grants that have one, two, three phases for them over time. And then like identifying the buildings, for example, um, when you, you take your iPhone and you see that little code thing and you can hold it up against it, it the next phase is to take these into apps. So rather than just seeing the building and getting one paragraph, you can actually get a whole history about the people that lived in the building or were buried in the cemetery. So we're trying to move to that next That's phase. Cool. That's very cool. So the next grant um, is the Kit Carson Historic Cemetery. We, I've just submitted this grant and we don't know that we've received it yet, but it's a restoration interpretive project. Um, if, it uh, calls for the identification of the, um, of the graves that are no longer legible, preservation and restoration of the historical graves and markers, and uh, restoration and repair of the original wrought iron fence surrounding the cemetery, and an informative display sign and map. The next grant is, uh, we have received this grant, and it's through the Youth Conservation Corps and it's um, a Kit Carson Park tree restoration and replanting grant. We'll be doing some landscaping on the entrance, the Asekia cleanup, and it's a collaborative project with Rocky Mountain Youth Corps. That will be happening this summer. Well, actually, it'll probably be starting in April.
Rick, uh, <coughs> in that particular grant, if we make sure that we uh, stay collaborative <coughs> with Pueblo, because I know we had some collaboration earlier that if there's water, it could be actually <coughs> a ditch. I know the ditch probably won't run to anywhere at this point, but the ditch could actually bring some water into the park if possible, as long as we have collaboration with the tribe. So we want to make sure. And we do pay us to get these, so yeah. the park. We have an upcoming grant through New Mexico Tourism. It's called an event sponsorship grant, and where we may request up to $40,000 for an, uh, an event that is greater than $80,000. That's to be held sometime between July and December 2015. I don't know that we've identified yet what that event's going to be, but um, Rick, I don't know if you're going to be taking public input on that tonight when we get to that on the agenda, but um, that is something that we can apply for. We have a community development block grant that we're going to be requesting a half a million dollars for the repair of the Youth and Family Recreation Center. The roofs and some of the exterior walls need to be replaced. We are also in the process of a community development block grant. It's a planning grant. Um, we're going to be starting our hosting the first public hearing Monday night. And it is the recommendation of staff to apply for a master plan for all three parks. And so under infrastructure improvements, um, the town, this is not a grant, but it's funds set aside from the town for the underground gazebo improvements to under the gazebo. Um, has a lot of issues with flooding and electrical problems. And um, at this point, it looks like we could just fill it. And also the gazebo sinking. So by filling it, kind of um, take care of all those problems. So that's basically where we are right now, just with the grants around at the plaza. So, are we going to entertain for questions, or do we just have to keep the agenda going? <laughs> does, does anybody have any questions? How, how, much, how much of this will, I, I assume a good portion are going to require matching funds. Have we identified which ones, <coughs> which ones are just freebies? Yeah, any, anything we have applied for, we've identified the match for from existing funds in the current budget. Right behind you. Awesome. Um, that Monday night meeting, again, what was that? I don't have that down. Oh, you know, it's actually Tuesday night. It's at the regular council meeting we're having a public hearing. Sorry about that. Oh, it's going to be two, at the regular council. Yeah, Tuesday afternoon. Public hearing on mm -hmm. For the CDBG planning grant. For the park. <coughs> Thank you. And I think the important part is to show you that not only um, is there an opportunity for real community involvement in each of these projects, uh, because all of them have a public participation element to them in the planning stages in particular. What, once we do the study of the history of the plaza, um, what are the historic uses? And there are a lot of you out there that have uh, information to contribute to that. And then what are the future uses that should be accommodated on the plaza? And State Historic Preservation is uh, very keen on that in the Old County Courthouse as well. Uh, same thing with the parks plan, a master plan for all our parks too. How can we use them more efficiently? All of these are going to require real input from you as the public that use these facilities and, and what you want to see in the future. So that's why your council is here tonight to get your input. Um, Yes, sir. Uh, Linda, first, uh, great job. I mean, this is something the house has been needing, so nice job. Um, is it possible for us to get uh, on the website or anywhere that we could see where grants that you have that have been approved and grants that you're going for and we could see an update of the status so that we can remain updated about it even if we can't make meetings? I think that's a great idea. I can talk to Carmen about that. Yeah, and, and also, Jay, I think it'd be a great idea for us to list the meetings as they develop that are associated with each of those grants so that folks that want to participate in that, but it's a great suggestion. Yeah. Any, other, any other questions on the grants? Thank you, Linda. With, with that, um, Chief? I really want to uh, give a thanks to the county that the new sheriff has uh, really uh, he, he spent a lot of time over here working with the chief. And I'm very proud of our police department that they've been very proactive 
Chief has done everything from obtaining kennels for um, uh, the stray dogs so that uh, after hours they can um, be safely contained uh, to equipment for the police department. He's, he's very aggressive in community outreach and he's got some great programs about the downtown that I uh, think he's going to talk about. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, good evening. Um, I've been, recently I've been told that I could, take, uh, I could talk the paint off of metal, so I've, I've been told to limit myself to some degree. Um, right off the bat, we do have some outreach happening on January the 30th. We have coffee from the cops, coffee with the cops. We do that every once a month, normally the last Friday. Um, this one's going to be January 30th at DMC Broadcast from 7 to 9 a.m. With me is going to be Sheriff Hogriff and also Chief Left Hand from Trevor. Then in February, February 17th and 18th and 19th, from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m., we're having a series of community meetings. The 17th is designed for not-for-profit organizations, civic organizations. The 18th was for business and merchants, and then the 19th is kind of a general meeting. What's neat about this is for those meetings, it's going to be myself, Sheriff Hogriff, um, uh, Captain from New Mexico State Police, Chief Left Hand, Chief Bates from Cuesta, Director Wallace from Talski Valley, and Marshall Smith from Red River. The rules that we, that I kind of arbitrarily applied to them, that they've agreed to, is I said when you walk through the door, you are not allowed to have any defenses. So if you start getting criticized real heavy, take it and really listen to that. There's two primary questions we have. First question is how have we done for the last year? The next question is what do you want to see from the year, for the next year coming? For the police department, this is a part of our um, readdressing our strategic plan. And so we're using that to help us fiscally determine where we're going to put our priorities. For the, uh, um, for the businesses and the merchants inside the town of Taos, we often talk about economic development and the things that we're going to do to, to develop and increase uh, traffic flow into the businesses. And I know that if you, if you got an incredible band here and you loaded up the town with tons of people and it takes 30 seconds to do an auto burglary, I know that we've just lost it. I mean, we understand that. Um, and so a lot of our outreach has been in um, really trying to address those people and try to track them. Uh, there is, people are, are highly predictable. It's called predictable law enforcement, so we've been working on that and a lot of public outreach. So now, as far as the plaza goes, um, there's a number of issues. We have, we have nuisance issues, and then we have crime issues, and then we have perception of crime issues. If you perceive it's a high crime rate area, it doesn't matter what I tell to you, <coughs> what I say to you, your perception is that it is a high crime rate area. That is just as valid as the numbers that I pull up on the computer. For the nuisance people, I mean, we have a lot of people that are panhandling, a lot of people that are um, just really, quite frankly, making it not an enjoyable environment. Um, that is not necessarily a law. That's not necessarily a law enforcement answer. It's not really putting them in jail doesn't resolve that issue. And what we did last year was we did um, it's called crime by environmental design. So in essence, what happened was in the morning, I'd get a cup of coffee and I'd sit in the middle of them. And in the afternoon, I'd get a cup of coffee and sit in the middle of them. And after a while, they decided they didn't like having coffee with me and they just kind of left. <laughs> well, so, so the next step is, well, where did they go to? You know, you know where did they move to? And um, since the sheriff isn't here, we found that they moved outside the town limits and they hit places in the county and I was like, okay, good. You know, we went. Um, so um, we also we also have a commitment to put an officer full time in the in the historic district. In the summer, it's really easy for me because I think Sanchez, I can just move them. I really want some there full time. Uh, we have two two officers that are in the field training program right now. It's going to take about another two and a half months. Then they're on probation for another six months. So they're not quite eligible for this. Till about in the nine months. We did hire a guy from Colorado who has more than 20 years worth of experience. He's an old guy like me. Um, I actually think he's going to be a very good fit. So we're going to discuss that with him. There's a field training program with him as well. Um, 
and it'll probably be three months until he's actually on the, on the road. So um, I think we'll be able to make that happen. We have one more person, one more slot that's open, and we've been very, very highly selected. We, it's real easy for us. If someone shows up and they're certified, it's real easy just to grab the person and hire them. Um, and my, my direction has been, is that person a fit? Does that person make sense? Is it something that works well in the community? And so far, after 10 months, we found one person. So we're hoping to see if that works. Um, that's about it, off the top of my head. I mean, we have tons of things going on, and kind of like my admin assistant says, it's like trying to hurt a cat. So I don't know if there's any questions or anything I haven't addressed, yes ma'am? When you said that you're going to have a police officer on the plaza, is that in the police department building or walking around the plaza? The idea is for that officer to actually be assigned, what's called the historic district, which is from Civic Plaza Drive to about where McDonald's is, and then about the same width across. And so that's actually the historic district. That's where that officer would be assigned. <clears throat> My idea really is to have a person who understands history, who enjoys history, who enjoys speaking to people, who also understands what bad looks like, understands what annoying looks like, and understands how to deal with all those things. And um, I mean, I would just love it if I had an officer that once a day could do a walking tour. Yeah. I mean, I would just adore that. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of the idea, and that person will be in there. Now, here's the problem. You're not necessarily going to have 24-hour access to the guy, you know? So like, we're gonna have to figure out when to schedule him. Um, and I say him because I'm pretty sure it's gonna be a guy. I mean, the two females, Sergeant Davis is, I have her multitasked all over the place and Shauna's doing, uh, she's, uh, Shauna's doing like a skyrocket as far as her progression of being a law enforcement officer. So, um, but that person, you know, we're gonna have to figure out the hours and that's gonna be dependent upon what's happening in the community. Um, it depends on a couple things. What is your perception of when the problems are? Bounced off with what statistically I believe the problems are, based off with what events we have going. So I think that's real fair to be incredibly flexible with the first Yes, ma'am. Will you have the uh, bicycle patrol out? Yes, ma'am. They'll be out and so on. I, 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 truth be known, um, many times I have to smack people and I say, listen, I need someone in the car. You know, so. Normally, we, we have a sergeant and two officers. We're trying to move, so we have three officers on shift. We, <coughs> we should have one of those people on the bicycle all the time. Yeah. It seems to me it would be a very good fit to have a mounted unit mounted on horses down there. But not only would it be very efficient, but it would be awesome in marketing and photos. I, I think that would be really neat. I mean, when I'm on the motorcycle, people, I mean, I, I'm sure I have photographs of me in Japan. Uh, really, really, you know, it, it's, it's really kind of weird. I'm sitting on the motorcycle and a lot of tourists just swarming the bike. I'm like, we'll take a picture of the bike. Um, with, with the horse, we really have the upkeep, the upkeep, the, up the training. Um, you don't just have a regular horse. The horse is really truly trained, crowd control and whatever. And quite, and quite frankly, it's just a cost that I don't really think we can absorb right now. Um, I would love it. I, many times I have people, you know, wanting to give me a horse. Um, and my wife says no, um, and I don't understand that. Um, the other thought that I had was if we could just invite, like Albuquerque Police Department, their horses, and I, I really would like to see that happen. And just about every cop I know in New Mexico, if they can get a trip to Taos, they're, they're in. So I'm really kind of thinking for special events, for Fiesta, for that stuff, I think it just makes sense. It really does. Sir? Yeah, the, uh, the auto theft is really, okay, so not, not to, uh, let me know when I need to be quiet. <laughs> Property crimes and opiate abuse are hand in hand. It just is what it is. So in the town of towns, our collision rates are down. Our crimes against persons are down. Every crime area that we have is down, except for crimes against property, or we're also getting overdoses. So we know those two are tied. And so anytime we have a large group of people and we have this going on, it absolutely is, this is one of the number one things the supervisors know, which is you need to drive around and keep an eyeball on this. Um, 
this is, I think, the leading challenge that we have, is to deal with the opiate abuse and the crimes against property. If we really knock down on opiate abuse, like we really just start arresting heroin, heroin addicts left and right, historically, methamphetamine takes its place, and now we have crimes against people that rise. And just kind of one of those dynamics. And I know that the town manager and I and the council, and this is an ongoing conversation of how we do this. One of, the, one of the reasons why I wanted all the chiefs and the sheriff to be in one room to sit down was so that we could develop a unified approach. So now if we resolve the crimes against property, we make it real difficult here, it just moves. Well, it's not a solution, you know. I truth be known, I don't know what the solution is, but it's got to be a very we're done now, you know. Chief, uh, just hearing you speak uh, triggered some of my thinking that, you know, being that we're meeting here early in the year, like now January, I'm already thinking ahead of the big events that we have scheduled for for the year. And I'm thinking already, it probably puts a big burden on your staff to be ready, for example, <coughs> at Central Command, like for the Solar Fest, which is probably one of the biggest. And in fact, is it going to be on the calendar this year? If it is, okay, we're going to plan for that. But you've got things like Task Fiestas, you've got the, uh, and even the Plaza Live now is becoming a big event on the Plaza with its, you know, uh, logistics, I guess what you call it. Uh, the Farmer's Market on the Plaza, I noticed it's got certain logistics now on Saturday morning, so another burden for you. Uh, things like, uh, well, and then I think it affects people in the downtown area and Sandy Dew Street, uh, Ben Street, uh, Kit Carson. Planning ahead, if there's a master, and it kind of dovetails on the question that was asked earlier, if there's a master website of the big events. So if I'm a business on the plaza and I know what the big events are gonna be coming, I know what those events are and I can plan my staff, I can plan my sales, I can plan my vacation, <laughs> uh, whatever it's going to be, if, if there's a master plan of the big events, I guess, you know. Because there's a lot of things, and I know she puts a burden on you. Uh, I don't know how much more you need assistance to get those events going so that you feel comfortable uh, in planning ahead for those big events, you know what I'm saying? I do, I do. The, you know, the, um, there, there are probably a couple things you, you may or may not know about the Dallas Police Department. Um, when you talk about um, events, federally there's a way of classifying them. So a, a, a Schedule 1 event is like the Hurricane Andy, and a Schedule 5 event is like a real good car crash that screws up traffic for a little bit. On the Fire Department Police Department, we have people that are qualified to level 1. We have people that have done this. And so it's really kind of interesting when we put together the work for the fiestas and everything, it's kind of like take it off the shelf, knock the dust off, change the dates, change the couple names, and then we're good to go. I really think that we're at a point that we should be able to do that. I should be able to kind of post out and say, this is what the event is, this is what we anticipate the traffic flow to be, this is the areas that we probably should or probably be affected. I think that's pretty reasonable. One of the newer ones that I've seen lately, like I just noticed the Martin Luther King uh, parade, I guess, on, on Monday, uh, and such events, the, the 1%, people standing at the, at the intersection. To, to me, I guess I'm just visually already starting to remember a lot of events that I said, oh, somebody, somebody in the police department is probably watching this, or somebody's yeah. kind of yeah. keeping an eye on all these things, and is it, and I don't want to say exclusive, but inclusive of the community, because it is our community. Right. And they're entitled to all these things, and the, the hub becomes a, a, a magnet for these type of events, right. including the people that, that we talked about are, are busking. But, right. but, but busking can become a nuisance, too, in a sense, because of what you said earlier about perception. Right. Uh, uh, so I guess the only closing thing I would go back to is that if there's a master calendar, if the town fathers could, uh, council could see to post a master events so we could kind of keep an eye on things. Oh, okay. One, by way of announcement, I don't know if I <coughs> put it out too soon, the uh, 
there's going to be, there's talk already about an event celebrating uh, the, the founding of the town of Towson, 1650. So, you know, that's, a, again, it's a monument day. Uh, St. Francis de Assis is, is celebrating 200 years. So there's going to be a calendar events for that. Uh, the Taos Art Society, I think, is 100 years. Uh, so there's going to be other events, and maybe those events will probably get one of getting on your calendar. But if it's the, you know, the Tarts of Taos Arts Festival, the, the car club show, what is it? The car club. I mean, they, I mean, it just piles, starts piling up. Mm -hmm. And logistically, it's going to start changing. But it, it comes down to what I was thinking earlier about mm -hmm. an article that I read where the council was going to be funding the marketing of Taos. And one of the things that we have discussed a lot of times in the, in the Taos project is that we go out and spend a lot, a lot of money for marketing Taos, and then the tourists come here and there's nothing to do. They, or if they don't know what to do, they don't know where to look for it. <laughs> uh, and I think there's so many things to do, and maybe if, if they could link into that master community calendar of events, well, that would do it all. Because I think people nowadays with these smartphones, they know where events are going to be now. And if that could be like a, a, an app or something that could be developed for the town for marketing, that's what I would suggest. So people could zero into those events and start capitalizing on them. Uh, not only for control, crime control, or whatever, crowd control, but for making money. Which is what we want to do for gross receipts. <laughs> anyway, I'll, I'll leave it there. Hey, I, I mean, I did just want to say, <coughs> having done several large events, so that people would know that there's a lot of meeting ahead of time, and we have an amazing uh, police force that has just gotten better and better. As the larger that the events have gotten, the more on that they have gotten. And I, you know, I just want to make sure that people do know that that is being worked on very hard for weeks and months prior to any big event. And these guys sort of go way above and beyond. I mean, uh, you know, they, were, they check out the reputations of the bands that are coming and if there has been any problems. I mean, they're that particular. And it's, it's amazing how professional they are. The other thing I was going to ask about is, uh, how did that Segway thing go? When they were talking about horses, remember we had a Segway trial here for a yeah. while. <laughs> Lieutenant Maggio, if you don't know Lieutenant Maggio, he, he truly is, he is a wonderful man. I, I truly love the sand to pieces. He wants a Segway. He wants a, the thing that flies up in the air. Uh, if you want, he wants a draw. <laughs> he, he, he says, for God, gotcha. it's going to be so great. We can do all sorts of, like, we are going to do a draw. <laughs> And then he wanted an armor personnel carrier. I'm like, why? It's because it's cool. Like, <laughs> not gonna happen. But I, you know, a lot. And, and his, he's like, segue, 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 segue. I don't got any segue. I, I haven't been convinced yet. I'm, I'm thinking you can walk. You need insurance. Um, but when we have the larger events, it, you know, I hate to say it, it kind of doesn't make sense. So we have two motorcycles that we use for traffic enforcement, they're 2007s. The one is really <coughs> small part, so I still want the more so I can ride it. Um, and so I think we're gonna sell one and then fix the other one, and then he's arm wrestling for the segment right now, so I don't know. Um, I want it to make sense, on the other hand, it just, you know. Um, what if we put friends on the handlebars? Oh, see, we're gonna put a little bell. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know. I mean, in, but now you know, going back to to the um, to the management side, um, our laptop computers and cars are are dying. The so we have two vehicles coming in. Thank goodness. We have a lot of technology improvement that we really need to focus on because right now the officers end up normally on day shift from 6 a.m. to about 10. Normally there's not much going on in the office typing. And then from 10 the calls start and then the next morning they're typing up those reports and so we're gradually getting behind and behind and behind. And it's because the laptop computers are failing. And so when we talk about segways or talk about whatever else, I'm really kind of having to push where I get the best thing for the buck. 
So that's kind of wrong. If you should look under line online, and you'll see a motorcycle. It's a very interesting. Strange enough, I think that's kind of a, a, those two pointers. <laughs> Chief, you just had uh, two officers graduate from the academy. Um, you might want to brag a little bit about that. Oh, yeah. I think that was a big accomplishment. James and James and Lucas, Lucas Martinez and James Salazar, just graduated the academy. Um, once again, we're talking about drill something. We have really tightened up our process. When I came in, we've had some very, very difficult conversations, and collectively, we've really raised the bar. Um, behaviors that are acceptable, and what we want, and how we want our people to act. And the first thing we did was we talked about the background investigation. And so, when an officer comes to get selected, it's like three months worth of investigation. A lot of money we pump in there, but the amount of money that happens on a bad hire, you know, really offsets that a lot. So these two guys really had a, a long process just to get accepted. Um, then they went through the academy, they graduated the academy, and so now they're in the field training program. Um, within that year of probation, um, they're not, there's very little slack that's allowed to them. Um, case in point, uh, one of the cadets um, had you know, these e-cigarettes, e and he was smoking them in the office, and so I just I went to the sergeant. Well, the sergeant said I told him not to do that. Well, why is he doing it? She goes, I warned him. I'm like, <coughs> and she said, well, you have a drink in your mouth. I'm like, I know. It's not fair, is it? She goes, no. You have to deal with it. You know, you have to deal with things that aren't fair. And then immediately I went and spit up the drink and <coughs> pretend like I didn't have one in the office. But for those guys, life isn't fair. I mean, it isn't. And if they trip up, they know that they're, they're going to get fired. Just I mean, very, very little, little wiggle room. So that year is just a tremendous stress. And you can see it on poor guys. I mean, there's days where we just tell them, sit in the office and relax, it's going to be okay. So um, good guys, both from the community. Both of them had different, um, well, Lucas had a uh, job offer in Burnley County Sheriff's Department, I believe. Um, Burnley County doubles our salary. You walk the door, your, your salary's doubled. And um, he had family, he had other connections inside here. This is the other good thing that we're looking at, which is right now is a good time to become a police officer as far as money goes. Um, Rainbow County will double salary immediately. There are asylum bonuses that are in the area of a thousand or in the area of ten thousand to twenty-five thousand. Hobbs will help will do fifty percent of the house. So now's the time to be a cop and now's the time to move on. Um, none of our officers have applications out. And and the chiefs we talked about this. So that's part of the strategic plan when we had a meeting with them, and, and I was kind of afraid to break broach the topic. But I was like, how come you guys haven't moved on? Why, why are you not taking these offers? And the answer was, well, we're happy. Okay. God bless you. So um, it, it's really, it's, it's kind of neat to have kind of a stability you know, happening all of a sudden. So we're going to try and keep that going on. And trust me not, it's not money. I mean, you talk to a copy like me, I don't want to pay us. Okay, do you want to pay us? Yeah. Do you want? Yeah. And I tell them you're not going to get a pay raise. They're like, okay. So, that's a good sign. Mr. Yes, Mark? You got a ready go? Thank you. Yes, sir. <laughs> good job, Chief. Um, if anybody doesn't know, I think everybody knows that. I still have one follow-up question. Sure. Can I just, because I'm, I'm going to forget. Go ahead. Uh, your grants person talked about a walking tour right. in, in that cricket. I was going to ask, is, does, uh, I'm just, can I ask a general question? How many people here own a business in the downtown area? So there's a good number here. I guess the, re the second part of my question is, if you would benefit from a walking tour, how many of you are in a, a placable building? Do you know what a placable building is? Uh, where you can get like a national register plaque and you can get a state plaque. And, uh, now, how many of you are placed buildings? 
So my question is, and my comment that would be, these buildings, you should probably start making the effort to get the plaques on your buildings because it adds a lot of class and a lot of credibility to this walking tour that they're going to be spending a lot of money. So it goes back to the expectation and outcome. So when tourists do go on a walking tour, I think they should be treated to a plaque building. Yes. And with that plaque building, people, the, the, the commercial people can have maybe a history of that building, and it adds to the quality of that tourism. That's my comment. I'll, I'll shut it down. <laughs> Yeah, actually, that's a, that's a really good point, Alan. Because in one of these grants, there is some money set aside uh, by the State Historic Preservation to add to the credentialing of those buildings to enable that process to occur. But it runs about 200 bucks, is what I was going to say. The, the, the national plaques, like the one at the courthouse, the old courthouse on the plaza, the national plaque, I think we paid 150 for it, and the state plaque was about 50 So that's, that's small, probably it could maybe get taken out of the grants. Uh, the other person I want to recognize is Oscar Palacios, who is the chair of the Historic Preservation Commission for us. He served on there as a prominent architect for quite some time. And we're, we're very proud that we have two prominent architects from the community uh, this year that sit on that board. So uh, it isn't just that they have paper, they really know what they're doing. Um, it was a great segue to talk about events, and so we're going to go through some of these. And again, this is not all inclusive, but uh, the council had asked, particularly the first section, anything that might involve uh, potentially needing for public safety reasons to close a portion, uh, one road, two road, all the plaza. Um, so, so far, obviously, uh, the classic event is the House Fiestas from the 16th to the 19th. Um, closure starts at 5 o'clock on Thursday uh, when the Fiesta Council House is moved on Wednesday the day before. Uh, that's, I, I gotta tell you, since the first year I've really been involved with the police department and watched them in operation doing that, and it was, it was really fantastic to see how, uh, how like a, a military drill, how quick that went. Uh, the Children's Halloween Party, um, which was held last year on the plaza, and I think uh, Judy Escobar, our best person, um, certainly would like to uh, have tried that again. Um, the 25th annual Yuletide caroling and tree lighting, which is here will be on December 4th, um, from 3 to 5.30. Rick, would you do me a favor? Down on the bottom there's a plus and minus. Would you make that a little bigger so we can see it too? Sure. Uh, <laughs> make it a little smaller. <laughs> That's good. Thank That's you. Good. That's perfect. Great. Um, we have the uh, Paseo Fall Arts Festival which was the first last year, um, and this year. Is Matt Thomas here? It's his birthday. It's his birthday. Oh, yeah, that's right. Um, <laughs> the date is September 25th and 26th for the Paseo opening during the Fall Arts Festival. Oh, good. Okay. And um, again, the suggestion has been, was that successful last year to do the concert? And if the Paseo is going to be multiple days, work that in and create a three-day weekend uh, to keep people here. Um, uh, tentative, uh, the decision will be made by the uh, city council, town council, uh, the farmer's market, which would be on Saturdays, and I believe that's the third Saturday in May. It's the second. Second Saturday through the third Saturday in October. Through the, all the way to all the way. Okay. Um, that is the third, because Mother's Day is the 10th. So the first we open Saturday in May. <coughs> so we, the farmer's market traditionally opens on the second Saturday of May. Every year. Okay, so not the, the 16th, but the, the, ninth. the ninth. The ninth, yes. So we'll be meeting with the organizations to fine tune these. And certainly we also want to add to this list. And Alan, that, that was a great idea. And that, that is the goal because we've had a lot of, uh, a lot of frustration, I think, by the marketing staff, too. That, um, you don't let us know until two days before it happens, and then it's too late, that sort of thing. So we have generic ads that don't bring people in and advertise those events. So that's on us to put that together. Uh, Taos Plaza Live, which is great and growing every year by the Chamber of Commerce. Susan is here today. Um, and that doesn't require any road closures, but it's a plaza activity, so we want to put it on there. 
the Children's Parade, which is from uh, Don Fernando to the uh, plaza, but it blocks off from Ocumino de los Placitos from uh, Ranchitos to Civic Park Drive. Um, any questions on those? Okay, so we're going to go on to the next category. Sounds like a game show. But your parades on the sale, um, and this is, these are, would be closures. So, uh, if you have this historical parade, uh, which starts at Albright, close to the post office, the high school homecoming from Albright to the post office, the, a new event, Councilman Cantu is uh, championing, the Downtown's Electric Light Parade, and the date for that has been selected as uh, Saturday, December 19th, is that correct, Councilman? Okay, and then that's going to be pretty exciting to add that. The Balloon Fiesta Parade, which this year will be a full parade, which again, another exciting event, uh, from Albright to the park. Um, the classics, the closure of Ladue Street, for the lighting of Ladue, closure of Ben Street, uh, for the bonfires on Ben Street. And any questions? Now, I, I would ask anybody that has events, that Sharon involved in or knows of events that have been left out here, please contact us. We want to make this list as comprehensive as possible. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, just a drop question here. There are occasionally special events. Sometimes they're religious in nature. For example, the Corpus Christi uh, procession events, part of the church. Similar kind of things, which have been part of part and parcel integral to culture and history of Taos for a long time. And some of these on very specific days. In order to, uh, I, I guess it's a simple thing, basically, to let the sheep know or the people know that uh, we're going to be having an event like this, whether it's a uh, you know, Catholic, Christian, Jewish, Muslim, whatever, whatever it might be, for that day, to get clearance and uh, protection and you know, coverage. Absolutely. And if, if people don't see me taking notes, we're being recorded from both ends of the room. And anybody would like a copy of this meeting later, but I anticipate there's going to be so many good ideas, we probably going to get out of here. Yes, sir, come back. Um, the Taos Lilac Festival, which is May 15th, 16th, and 17th uh, this year. Uh, thank you. Uh, we had our first organizational meeting last night, and uh, there was proposed at that time for a pet parade to once again go from the Guadalupe Church to the Kit Carson Park. So that would be a procession, not necessarily road closure, but we would be asking for a uh, police um, escort. And then on the, that's on the 16th, Saturday. And on Sunday, a procession of the antique cars from the House Town Hall, I believe, to the park also. So there are just processions where we will be requesting road closures. Just wanted to bring that up if you want to start adding something, something proposed to the calendar. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. And that, that same weekend is also the weekend that last year was the Dennis Hopper Day. I, I don't know yet if that's going to happen again. Uh, but if it is, we've asked that those events coordinate for that weekend. Um, and one of the interesting things is the grant not listed up there, which unfortunately was the first one. Linda got turned down for it. And it's always tough when you start, you, you don't get that first one. But it's one we want to consistently continue to do. And that is that for the Lilac Festival, um, we, we put in some money from uh, Los Hortoneros, who was part of that, Rocking Mountain Youth Corps. There were some really great groups volunteering at the time. And it was a master plan for replanting uh, the entrances to the park, uh, revitalizing the lilacs, uh, redoing some of the shade trees in there. Uh, so the park actually reflected at that time the festival, more of a, people would see from the sales they drove by, a more visible showing of, of, of different types of lilacs. But we're going to continue to pursue that. Uh, we had gotten another grant out of the same batch for the urban forestry study 
So I think that's why it didn't get funded, but we can put in a few months more for that. I, I do want to say for those of you that are sitting in the back, there's plenty of chairs up here in the front. And also, Rick, that Youth this Conservation one. Corp grant, we're just going to fold in that landscaping on the front. And um, so I think we'll, we will be able to put some lilacs in the front. Uh, okay. The uh, next part is the farmer's market. And uh, Paul, do you have a... Yeah, I have a fun drive already. Okay. Okay. Again, the decision has not been made by the council as to where the farmer's market will be. But what I did ask Paul to do, there, there are two groups working together on the farmer's market. I think it's going to be bigger and better than ever. Uh, <coughs> it's going to try to tie into the whole bigger picture and of uh, sustainable agriculture, green agriculture community. But there were a number of comments last year made of concerns of, of parking, how do I get my product? To my car. Um, people wanted to know about animals. Um, uh, businesses concerned about, well, they're blocking the views of my business. How do people know I'm open? So we did ask the farmer's market to address this. So again, this is not location specific, but um, I think the market is proposing a lot of improvements that, regardless of location, will really make it a better experience. Thanks, Rick. Um, I'm, I'm Paul Cross. Council, public, merchants, farmers, everyone, thank you for coming tonight so we can uh, revitalize our town and uh, our businesses and keep agriculture thriving. Um, you know, the, um, up until the late 1960s, there were farmers selling produce out of the backs of their trucks on the plaza. And then, um, as the supermarkets got bigger and people started shopping more at the supermarkets, a lot of people moved away and got jobs and, and uh, agriculture got a little bit smaller in Taos for a while. And, but there's been a renaissance over the last 20 years to the point now where we have a very thriving local food system that's evolving here in, in Taos, which is really special. Um, although Taos is, what, about the 44th in terms of population, the town of Taos, um, in the state of New Mexico, our farmer's market has, is number four in sales. So we have a very special, special market here in Taos that, um, very few other towns have. And you know, if you look at, at, at the way that consciousness is evolving, it used to be like you could have a town and as long as you had you know, electric and sewer and water, that would be enough amenities for your town. And then eventually you had to have cable TV. And then eventually you had to have internet. And now eventually you have to actually have a farmer's market to really be a thriving, vital town. You have to have a vital farmer's market going. So this picture before you, um, this was taken by Lenny Foster at one of the early markets, um, uh, probably right around in June, I would say. And so the, um, through the vision of the mayor and the town manager and the council, we did an experiment of let's put the market on the plaza and see just see. And then we can come back together as a community and, and assess that. And that's a lot of what tonight is about. 
But what we've done with, with Lenny's picture is we've added a few elements here. So some of the stuff wasn't really there on the plaza <laughs> last year. Um, so if you look up in the, in the back, you see there's a horse-drawn wagon going through the, through the market. And um, council members, mayor, you have a, um, a pamphlet in, in here. And you'll see a map where we're looking at the, uh, there's that, what's called the Loretto parking lot, which is over by Parfield and Taos Elementary, um, that we would like to, uh, as, a, as a publicity event, let's, let's do uh, a horse-drawn wagon for, for one market, take the customers from, from the parking lot, and we, you'll see in there there's a map of what the route would be. It would take them to the southwest corner where they could get out and enjoy the market and get a ride back down into there. So really pull the historic feel back together of, of um, the way it used to be. Um, we, look, we have some of the older pictures um, of that produce was you know, sold out of horse-drawn wagons at, at Taos Plaza. And so it'd be really fun to try to get that feel back. You'll see in the front that there's kind of a, a, a pen full of animals. So, um, you know, in the old days, everyone had animals. Everyone had farm animals. They, um, and that's really coming back slowly. But it's such a treat for, for the kids to see the animals. You know, you, if you look at like Taos Wolf Festival, everyone loves to go see the llamas and the alpacas, the uh, angora, rabbits, the whole, the whole thing. So we could pull the, the animals back into the market too. Um, to, to give it uh, a, a nicer feel. And then you'll see that there's, a, there's an A-frame sign like right in the, on West Plaza Drive there, um, back just above the umbrella. And that is, you know, we don't know what the legalities are. This is more of our visioning kind of thing. We need um, an opportunity. We, we could have these signs to direct very explicitly the customers to the brick and mortar businesses. So it would say, this way to Sunshades of Taos, this way to Taos Mountain Candles. And so we would strategically place them, not only to go to the, um, just the, the businesses that are actually on the plaza, but the corridor businesses as well. And we wanted to make, make those signs large enough that um, store owners, if you, had, if you were going to run a special during farmer's market or a Saturday special or something like that, that you could post flyers on this sign during the farmer's market. So we're trying to figure out, we know that we're pulling a thousand people a day on a Saturday morning in, into the downtown area. So we, need to, we know that that's impacting a lot of people. Um, some, some good, some bad, or some nothing at all. We'll see. You know, that's what the dialogue is all about. But um, we did want to just look at the possibility of um, staying on the plaza. Um, and I, I guess it would be like a, a three-year agreement is what we're looking for. Because the, um, in order for us to really thrive, you know, the farmers are already planting now. Right, the, the leeks and the onions that you're going to buy this summer, they're already planted right now. And um, if we have a if we have a stable, long-term vision with the town of where we're going to be <coughs> and what improvements we can make and what kind of investments we can make to make this all successful for everyone, um, that would really, really help to make a better event and enable us to make the investments that we need to do as a market to to make this all work. Um, parking is, is definitely an issue. Um, one of the things we would like the town to consider would be there's, uh, there's two parking lot, what I call like Saki's parking lot, um, which is kind of, you know, in front of Eskies, plus there's the one with the chili roosters right on the corner of Kit Carson and the main highway. Both of those are um, in, in private hands and they're, they're parking lots, they're paid parking lots now. It, I would like, I don't know if the resources are there, but it would be nice for all of downtown if, if the town could consider leasing those two parking lots, that would be more free parking downtown. And I think that, that would be a very helpful thing, not just for the farmer's market, but for all of the merchants. And it would be convenient for people who wanted to park there and you've got a half a block to get right into the plaza. So that would be really nice. Um, 
So that's part of that horse-drawn wagon concept. Um, this was the plaza as it looked in August. We have um, almost 100 small businesses that came through and sold at the Taos Farmers Market in this last year. There are 71 farms and 20 in the value-added side. The entire plaza was completely full uh, with 71 booths. And this was in a, a year where we had a late frost and it was a, a bad fruit year. So when we have a good fruit year, it's going to get even bigger. We can see up to about 120 farms that would be coming, selling things such as apples and cherries and peaches and apricots. You know, some of those, some of those crops only come in like once in every seven years, but when they do come, they come in huge abundance and it makes the market all that much more lovely. Um, we want to see more chili roasters in market. You know, the, we actually have tour buses that are coming from Albuquerque now, dropping people off to come enjoy not only the Taos Farmers Market, but the rest of downtown, all of the merchants. And um, so there, there is, the reason that people come to Taos is our authenticity, right? They come because we are a very special place. We have a sense of place that is very unique in America. And so the farmer's market is, is a part of that authenticity. And it's a part of the draw of to why people come. Now those tourists, are, they're not going to buy a lot of vegetables unless they're staying at you know, some sort of a bed and breakfast where they have a kitchenette or something like that. But your average hotel room, they're not going to, um, they're not going to be buying from, from the farmers. They'll be buying something from the value-added people, but they'll be enjoying downtown, and they'll be staying downtown longer. So this was just a mock-up of a possibility that we wanted to present of, we could, this is the, the Merchants of the West Plaza Drive. So we could have these signs, <coughs> good-sized signs, that we could have within the market to try to drive business to the stores. Um, so if um, this is how to, to contact the farmer's market, if you go to farmersmarket.org or you go to our contact page, that's a good way to reach us. If you call the voicemail, um, that's a little bit slower because it's you know we, we physically do not have an office anywhere. Um, the entire um, board of the farmers market is here. We've got some of the Comita members here as well. We have some of our other vendors who are not on the board but are, are farmers. And um, so we have just a, a very extensive packet of information for the councils so that you understand have all the vision. We want to drive more events on the plaza. We also want to make sure that we get off of the plaza in a timely manner. Um, and that's really hard to get our farmers to, to, you know, they're used to being in town hall where they can sit and, and talk with the other farmers for an hour after market. That, that can't happen anymore. We really need to get off the plaza when, when sales are done in a, in a prompt manner. Um, so we would really much appreciate if the council would consider putting us on the plaza for, for uh, uh, the next three years. And uh, I know that we're, we're here to hear everyone's concerns, and we have a whole board here so that we can implement whatever it is that uh, we need to.
getting it as close to the plaza as it is preferred. Um, but at the same time, if we can just all kind of come together, brainstorm some ideas as to what's the best, you know, course of action for that. Um, just because at this point, as tight as our budget is, um, I, I, I really don't see any wiggle room within the budget to entertain another lease for another parking lot. Okay. So just just food for thought. Don't want to mislead anything or, or, or give false hope in that area. Um, but just if you could talk on it, or if you guys have discussed it. Yeah, we have we have looked at at other locations, um, and we actually, um, just as a contingency, because we don't, we don't know what the council's decision is going to be. Um, and um, eventually, we're going to, um, we pretty much outgrown the town hall parking lot already. Um, and so the only other alternative we have would, would be either the county or going to private land but we like being downtown. And the reason to be downtown is that, you know, we need to be a part of the historic district. Um, if, we, if we're on the north end of town, it makes it harder for the people on the south end of town to get to the market, and vice versa. If we're on the south end of town, the people in the north have a hard time. So when we're right, uh, right there at the, the line, right between north and south, it, it works the best for everyone. Um, I think parking went okay. The, with this last year, there are 700 parking places downtown, just in the just in the public areas, and uh, you know the, our customers, they will follow us wherever we go. Um, so, I I understand that the, the town's budget is stretched, um, but you know if we're if we're here for our wish list, that's why I just throw that out there. Thank you, and, and it's not so much as a deterrence. I, I, the, the additional parking, is that for the horse drawn stuff or is that for just in general, parking in general? Well, I, I just, I think it would just be in general, really. So the, the horse drawn would go from the bus stop um, at the par field parking lot there, and it would just, and it would just run the route. And it, it would just be like one or two Saturdays. We wouldn't do that every, every week. Do you know who owns that parking lot? The Loretta parking lot? No, 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 the, 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 the one on the other side. Yeah, the Parfield park. Yeah. Yeah. School district. The school district. So I imagine we probably would be able to enter into some type of agreement with that to be able to park in there. We, we had already had some discussions with them in, in the development of uh, uh, Town Hall Drive and the additional parking, and um, certainly during the year when it was dirt, uh, people were parking there right up to the curbs. And School was fine with that. And I, and I don't think, on, uh, to add on to what Councilman uh, Gonzalo was saying, um, I don't think the plan was, I don't want it to seem like the plan was to let's just buy those lots. It was just uh, the town uh, for at least one year, I think it was two years actually, uh, leased so that there was free parking during Thursday night uh, concerts. Yep. Uh, on that, and the, the parking remained the responsibility of the owners at least from what I saw in the agreement, it was just we subsidized the owner so that he didn't actually collect from people that park there. So this would just be from probably 8 to 1 o'clock to 8 to 12 on Saturdays. And, and it probably wouldn't need to be the whole year because uh, the market kind of ramps up over time and then it peaks and it sort of falls off. So it's just those, that probably that six to eight weeks in the middle of the season that really it's, it's packed most of the day. And Paul, uh, is there any concession uh, maybe in moving your hours of operation up a little bit so it might terminate a little earlier and maybe start a little earlier? Because I know a lot of number of businesses on the plaza don't open to a certain time, so the impact would then be um, less dramatic. Uh, to some, yeah, we can be a little better balance. <coughs> we can definitely look at that. Um, I know that we, our commitment for this last year was to be off the plaza at 2 o'clock, and that didn't always happen, no matter how hard we tried. Um, and so what we, we certainly, the board's already um, looked at maybe if we close the market a half an hour early, and at our spring vendor meeting that we really put, 
you know, really drill into our vendors that they need to be out of there within an hour of the closing, because they have a lot of stuff to pack up, um, that we would, we should easily be able to, to get, um, we, could, we could start earlier in the morning, I know that Santa Fe does that, uh, but we can also just um, trim some of the time off the, the end of the day um, for the for the merchant's sake. I'm gonna pass the mic around. I'm gonna ask this to Rick or Paul. I'd like to know what the issues are with having art as part of the value added in the farmer's market. I can give two examples, someone can set up a booth and paint portraits and sell them, or someone else could paint just the vegetables and sell them. And I've, I've heard that that's been completely mixed. There's no way we can have artists. And it's curious to me that in this great art town, that seems to be the one place we're not welcome. Yeah, actually, I do want to correct that because uh, Paul uh, has, uh, in the head of the Arts Council, uh, has held a number of meetings where um, he has uh, tried to uh, talk to the arts community about the idea of being more visible particularly for the tourists, of, and having art on the plaza and artists on the plaza and uh, being more integrated into the But at those meetings, we were told we couldn't sell. The artists, you like them there as entertainment to watch us paint, but we were told we couldn't sell our paintings. It, there, there is a regulation regarding that. Actually, there's a regulation regarding activities that are permitted to use the plaza, whereas closure is required to you. And that's part of the things I, we're going to have to bring back to council for their consideration to see what works best. I, I think part of the grants we have to study the plaza and see how it can work better for what the community is doing now, which, which ironically the State Historic Society came back with a description of what it used to be like 100 years ago and said that seems to be exactly what people want to do now. So but again, I think that's a process the community, your voice needs to be heard and your opinions need to be forwarded to council. And we have some regulations that maybe don't make sense anymore. But at the same time, I think if you go back to what the chief said, we don't want to create a situation where it's wall-to-wall -wall people from out of town painting and selling on the plaza and hurting galleries and the artists that are here. It's got to be done in a way that's fair to everybody. Uh, before we, we go on to the Mayor, question with the audience. I, I did want to give um, uh, Comita, which is a new group, a chance to just very shortly describe what your group is. Um, I think they had a, a great dimension in a partnership with the Farmers Market that they're working with Red Willow, the Extension Service, uh, a lot of agricultural related organizations. But uh, they also did, and we thank them for that, went to talk to all of the businesses in the downtown about this and it got some ideas about the problems uh, that people want to see addressed and what they thought was good. And I, I think that might help us to focus the discussion when we open it up to the crowd, if that's acceptable. Is that on the uh, computer? Uh, yeah. Hi everybody, I'm Marco Schmidt, and um, Angelo McCourse from uh, formerly the director of the Red Willow Farmers Market, and I are co-directors of a new organization called Comida. And our focus is uh, quite a bit broader. It's on rural economic development um, with a focus on agriculture. We're looking at um, how uh, the entire value chain of growers to buyers, and we're uh, <coughs> First of all, gathering information. Um, we have a survey that will be coming out um, uh, in the beginning of February to all people who are involved with agriculture, but particularly focused on growers, looking at what their needs are, um, how they're currently marketing, uh, what markets they're using from um, farmer's market to wholesale markets. Um, we've developed partnerships with organizations like Siete del Norte and uh, Chicanos por la Cosa that are actually opening up uh, wholesale markets and we're looking at ways to share information about those markets 
and open up new avenues for farmers in this area to find markets. And um, Paul and I have been talking about ways to partner together so that the farmer's market not only is a terrific venue for selling locally here, but so that there's also <coughs> other markets that farmer's market vendors can participate in and so that we can share information um, across uh, all the different groups, including merchants and vendors who are impacted by the farmer's market. So one of the informal surveys that we conducted this last week um, was to talk to as many of the merchants and uh, shop owners that are located on the plaza or near the plaza. And um, I uh, made an effort to, to try to talk personally um, with owners or managers. And um, there were some very good uh, substantive conversations where we were looking for common ground about uh, <coughs> issues that affect us all. Parking was one of the number one issues. Um, everybody, I think, had a certain kind of frustration with parking. Um, it's an issue that we need to roll up our sleeves and figure out solutions for. Um, some very interesting ones came up. Um, what you're seeing right now is a spreadsheet that has um, some of the data that we collected. And um, uh, what we did is we asked all of these respondents two questions. Number one, are you in favor of the market returning to the plaza in summer of 2015? Um, I had 34 uh, respondents uh, that I spoke to, and of those, over 80% of them uh, indicated yes, they were in favor of the market returning to the plaza. Uh, there was five um, no's and two no comments. Um, the second question that I asked all respondents was, do you have any suggestions or ideas about what the market or the town could do to make this a success for your business or for other merchants? We got some really great information going. Um, I think that one of the things that's really needed in uh, you know, developing a farmer's market is not just the market itself, but this free flow of information and development of relationships with all the people who are impacted by the market. And that really came up in this survey where people had amazing ideas about how to um, leverage the market as an event. And you know, uh, Paul brought up some of uh, the signage uh, possibilities where the market can use its draw to then direct people out to the merchants. Every merchant that I spoke to thought that was a pretty good idea. Um, how can we use our marketing uh, muscle and then lend support to our vendors? Um, there's a bunch of different things that came up, but um, and uh, this, this study will be available to all of you, but I think that the, I'll just close by saying, uh, Comida and the Farmers Market Inc. are partnering to do an event that's not only the best darn farmers market in the state, but that's also a world-class e event that still brings value to our local merchants and to our shop owners. It's very important that we all rise together and that we uh, make this an event that really supports everybody's economic interest here. We had a question here first, and we're going to open it up now, Rick. Yeah. Okay. And then we'll get around the room. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Andres Vargas. I, uh, I applaud the efforts of the town council and everybody here in supporting the, uh, the plaza and um, the activities and events uh, that were listed there, and all the ones that have been mentioned are wonderful things. These are things that all communities provide for their people. My concerns, and what I'm going to talk about, is strictly relating to the park, the plaza park, and the county courthouse. Uh, that is because the owner of the plaza is the county of Taos, not the town, although for I don't know how long the 
the town has assumed jurisdiction and has made decisions. Uh, and for up until this administration, all decisions, I think, were virtually made in behalf of and, the, and at the prompting and, uh, at the, by the uh, merchants without any due consideration paid to the owners, which is the county, the people from Taos County. And in March 25th of 1935, and then in uh, May 21st of 1935, the Delano Roosevelt administration granted deeds, patents, to the Taos County Courthouse, I mean the, court, uh, the courthouse in the plaza, and the park. And what I would like to see, uh, well first, I, I, I don't know how it is that the town assumed jurisdiction and uh, continues to make decisions. I do applaud and I hope that it is with the cooperation of the county because the, uh, at least with respect to the, uh, the plaza and the uh, courthouse. With respect to the courthouse, I, the only thing I would like to see is the courthouse building where the old court used to be, that it be old, may be um, converted into a place for youth, for the children of this community. That they have a place. Las Vegas has an incredible um, program um, where the youth go to this place and they meet, they, they, it, it's theirs. And it's a wonderful thing. I advise, uh, maybe they could look it up. I don't remember the name of it, but they need a place, um, and that would be an excellent place. Even those murals um, would be very inspirational and, and teaching and that thing for, for the values of the children. Anyway, with respect to the park, what I'd like to see is a farmer's market that is open, not only on one day on Saturday, but every day. Every day for the entire growing season. The other thing that I would like to see is, it is a historic place. There should be a sense, whoever is hired, if anybody is hired, have, should have a sense of history. This is a historic plaza, and parking meters have no place, in my opinion, in the parking here. I know that uh, there are issues as to parking, but my suggestion with respect to that is that the park at Kit Carson, down on Kit Carson, that the, the town and with the cooperation of the county uh, issue public bonds to build a multi-level parking lot, a really nice one, and that they, uh, if they continue to, they spend a, a an enormous amount of money, um, which is not offset by the income from the parking meters. Uh, I, the other thing that I would like to see is the closure of vehicular traffic in the plaza. Uh, Santa Fe has done it, is doing it. Albuquerque has done it. This is, I want to see a true commons, the idea of the commons. And, um, in order to implement this idea of the commons, which has to do with the mental health of the community, because people need a place to go to and congregate at any time of the day or night. And this, you, the plaza park used to be the center of our community. It should return to that, and that's what I would like to see. Uh, I have other ideas, but I relinquish them. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, I did want to point out that um, for the information of the public, the town and the county um, did agree on their CDBG priorities and their three legislative funding priorities. Um, the top two were, uh, uh, the first one was Camino de Medio, which is going to be a long-term project to try and relieve some of the traffic congestion through the downtown. And yeah, I think it's a wonderful partnership between the town and the county. Uh, the second one was the old courthouse. And uh, we have both put in to support a regional animal facility. Uh, unfortunately, that was not our ICAP. That's our capitalist. And we have actually, the, the county is talking about supporting us with, if there's money, to help us with the youth and family center. So I think you are seeing the town and county working together 
uh, in the plaza and realizing it's historic with any kind of potential. If I could, thank you, Mr. Wells. Um, I think what's more important than who owns what is that we work together to do better serve the citizens. And, and that's what we're going to do. And um, talking about the courthouse, we have a presentation that will be coming up Tuesday where we're doing a refinance on the Agricultural Center, which is going to free up $700,000, which we're going to devote to the courthouse. Wow. Wow. Start addressing to make it because I think originally we wanted this meeting to be there, and um, you know it would have been really nice because of ADA compliance and, and things of that nature. It's not possible right now, but we're not going to be doing that in the future. It's going to be possible. So awesome. working together and and being creative with the the finances and stuff is is what's going to get it uh, get it going and keep it going. So. Yes, we're going to work together and we're going to get it done. Thank you, Jim. Um, just to reiterate what Mr. Jim Kett was mentioning, if you look into Warehouse 21 in Santa Fe, that would be a perfect example of what he's talking about with you. Um, my question is for you, Paul. I would like to know how many local locals that are not with recipients come to the farmer's market consistently. That are not with recipients? Mm -hmm. That are that are not. Not what? I'd say most of them. Say, yeah, you know, we have a we have a program in place. I would say that the I we haven't researched that. That may be a topic for research. My my guess is that probably there's more people who are not with recipients at market because local produce is expensive to produce and uh, so and the, the <coughs> farmers margins are incredibly thin so a lot of times you see prices at the town's market that might be higher than, than other places where produce is available in town um, we did submit a grant for um, to do a two for one match so that people who are using um, their EBT cards that you could get Two dollars for every one if the grant comes through, um, so that that makes the produce much more affordable. Um, we do have there's there's not only the the WIC there's um, the <coughs> farmers market nutrition program as well, and that's where the the mothers get checks that are, can only be used for fresh fruits and vegetables at farmers markets. So we have that program in place already, and there's also a senior uh, nutrition program as well and those checks we also take at market as well so we're, we're doing our best to try to serve the entire community no matter what their economic status is in fresh healthy local food well when you were talking about parking and the issues involved with the parking mm -hmm. it kind of struck a thought in my mind there's this really beautiful <coughs> field behind the courthouse there's nothing there. And I don't know how many locals have ever noticed, but how often do you drive by Super C in the summer and see the car show and say, oh wow, let's get down and go check it out. Didn't you know about it, but because you passed it, decided to go check it out. There's this beautiful field with so much parking around it. And I would almost guarantee that more locals would see the farmer's market and take a look and go buy it and purchase groceries over even next door at Super Save and have that luxury of more parking, but you're closer. You're still in town, but you're also closer to more locals. Yeah. I don't know yeah. what you guys think, but I, I would... <coughs> If I had, I struggled to find a farmer's market this summer, and I didn't even know how to find it, and the last time I knew where it was at, it was the town hall, but I just thought maybe you could, you know, ponder the idea a little bit. We did, we definitely did consider that as a possible location. Uh, we pulled the, the vendors of the Taos Farmer's Market, and we had, Marco did that survey this last summer, and maybe you could talk about that. Sure, yeah. There was a survey that we did. 
So, um, we did a survey in July last year of vendors to find out uh, their level of enthusiasm for showing up at the plaza specifically. And uh, 45 vendors responded to that survey. 43 were in, uh, uh, gave a yes, and two said no. Um, so the vendors in July were very much, of course, in favor. Um, but I want to get back to your question about the WIC recipients because um, I work with the WIC office locally here at Abbey Maestas, and um, the thing that uh, was really amazing to me is that uh, there was $8,000 worth of WIC money circulated just in our community. Um, and it was circulated among uh, 3,000 recipients. Uh, so uh, that was a, a big success as far as the WIC office was concerned. And I think statewide, you know, we got some notice about how we really were proactive about setting up booth space and taking WIC recipients on tours and introducing them. And, you know, this year with cooking demonstrations and other sorts of educational activities, we want to figure out ways to make the market far more accessible to everybody. I mean, I, I don't know what anybody thinks about the idea of putting it in that field, but then there's the other side of the spectrum of <coughs> if we're continuing to do it in the plaza, since there are merchants concerned about business stats going lower, why not let their employees set up a stand around the plaza with you guys while you're doing the farmer's market so that they're still getting their sales and the people that are in the farmer's market can see there. Yeah, looking for ways to cross market is one of the things that we fell down on last year. You know, I think there was a lot of things that we could have done had we known earlier that we were going to be moving to uh, the plaza uh, that we could have done in terms of building better community relations, and we're trying to do that this year. So um, that's certainly an effort that we both want to do. But I just wanted to point out two things. Like I said, 80% of the merchants that were surveyed were in favor of the market. And not only that, but there were a number of merchants that were vehement about how much more business that they were doing. Um, that this isn't true for everybody. And there's, we can do better in terms of helping out our merchant partners. But there, are, but there are a bunch of merchants that made a big point of saying that the market drew new customers from the Gorge, La Fonda, uh, they said, we love you guys. You guys brought in, I mean, our guests came back raving about a new experience that they had. Um, you know, uh, the Adobe, um, uh, Taos Adobe over here, which is fabric, not something that you really think would be go along with the farmer's market. Um, they were talking about how people were coming in from the market excited about things. Um, Moby Dickens, one of my favorite factoids from last summer was, uh, Jay said, we're in favor of the farmer's market because on Saturdays, cookbook sales are up 14%. <laughs> so. Well, that's why I said yes, because you know, I'm not really sure what. So, the conditions are hot. When you mention some ideas, then I can do some brainstorms at you. Thank you. Yeah. Something can help you with that. Yeah, thank you. Something to ponder. Thank you. Um, yes, I just want clarification on financing in regards to farmers' markets. Does the town get any money from the state agriculture department to host a farmers' market? A and B. Do the farmers pay the town of Taos any money uh, to have to be in the farmers' market? Does the town receive any money from the farmers' market? And even do they receive any tax monies from the farmers' market? Yeah, good question. Um, yes, the the um, the we have gross receipts tax on items that the that the farmers sell that that goes into the town. Probably not food. No, but food's not taxed. On the the only thing that I'm not talking about the food. I'm talking about the the farmers market sells hats, t-shirts, all kinds of stuff. <coughs> Um, on the order of about ten thousand dollars a year, and we do collect gross receipts on tax. But not on, on that. Not on food, though, correct? Right. 
In, indeed, there, we do not collect tax on food. Okay, it's there. predominantly a food market. Exactly, market. yes, okay. yes, yes. We are, we are focused on local food um, primarily. And we do have, um, we do have in our existing lease with the town, we have a um, fees that the farmer's market pays to the town. And um, it's very modest. Um, but there is, uh, the town does not receive any money from any state agency or federal agencies in order to host a farmer's market, unfortunately. The money to run the farmer's market comes from the farmers. And um, so the, the farmers pay, you know, either a daily fee or a season pass in order to be there. And so if you're paying for a season pass, again, it's not something that has gross receipts tax. Uh, we do pay uh, employment taxes for all our employees and all of that. You know, we are a full legal corporation. Hello, I'm Ryan Langa from Art Rivers Jewelry on the Plaza. <coughs> Last year, when the plaza was chosen as a location for the farmer's market, the merchants were told there would be a temporary experimental location which would be objectively reviewed and evaluated at a later date. After the event was held in the town's plaza from May until October, it has been determined that there are main problems with this location. The plaza parking spaces and surrounding area parking lots are greatly impacted with both farmers and the retail activity of the downtown area businesses. The majority of the parking spaces were blocked off by the farmers for their booths, and in some cases, farmers were parking in the north plaza spaces reserved for customers. People had a hard time finding spaces to park for any reason in the downtown area. The hours of the operation were listed at 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. It did not relate to the actual time three quarters of the plaza was closed off to traffic. In reality, the majority of the plaza was closed from 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. to allow for setup and teardown. The teardown included trash removal and final clearing of farm vehicles at the end of the event. Tourist buses could not access the plaza properly. Last summer, they got stuck in the plaza, and in some cases, the buses had to back out onto Paseo del Norte through traffic lights. Some, but not all farmers, were allowed to bring their trucks onto the Taos Plaza. This helps them replenish their stock during the day. There is no room for all farmers to have their trucks on the town's plaza so that farmers were at a disadvantage at this point. This site does not allow for future expansion of the farmer's market without causing even more of an impact on town's plaza businesses. This event negatively affected the Saturday sales patterns of the town's plaza merchants. In general, the town's plaza was too small a site for this type of event. At this time, let me stress, I am not discouraging all activities in the plaza. Events that are suitable for the site size and which do not block off the plaza are most welcome. Events that do not infringe or compete with local businesses are acceptable. Events that pertain to arts and culture are encouraged. In conclusion, I would like the, <clears throat> the town council and Taos County to consider moving the farmer's market to Taos County parking lot. Yeah. The Taos County parking lot alleviates all the problems that we've had last year and allows the farmer's market to flourish and expand. It keeps the Taos Plaza open for area merchants to engage in business and serve the community and visitors alike. I further request the town council and the Taos County commissioners make the final decision on the farmer's market and not the town of Taos administration. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. I, uh, I have a question for our city manager and our, our mayor and the council as well. Uh, I do represent a family business that's on the plaza that's been quite successful and still will be with or, or without a farmer's market. I have a window of opportunity to evaluate right here, and I want to address the city manager and mayor. In this decision-making process, is there an amount of money 
available to the city that the community and the public is not aware of as you choose to promote harmless market? Are these funds that we should be aware of that are part of what causes you to host this and enter? Are you saying is the money coming to us personally? Not yet, but on the table. No. I would love if our grants administrator continues to look for funding that would help the broadening, broadening of, of our downtown area, to help look for money to revitalize the downtown, maybe make more green landscape, maybe uh, bring, take some of the pavement off it, make it a little easier for people to navigate in the plaza and, and make it better for the whole community. But no, there's not money coming to any of the council, any of the mayor, any of the manager. It's money that we would ask our grants administrator to look into to see if there's any opportunities within the state, with any opportunities that might be able to fund revitalization, uh, brick and mortar <coughs> for the plaza to, you know, maybe some more trees, maybe some more zero scape, uh, that greenery. That answer your question? Kind of. Um, I personally feel that we should try to work together better, to have a plaza which will be like a great big living room for everybody in house. When we go to SIDS, we always meet people, we start talking with each other. We should do the same at the plaza. We don't have to have the, as many uh, cars as we have in general. Just the disabled people should have one area where they could put their cars. And the rest of the cars, could, an arrangement could be made with one of the church that has an enormous parking space <coughs> and is really within walking distance. I'm sure that the church, maybe if, if, the, if the town or even the farmer's market could give a little money to them, they would make that uh, an arrangement that, that would be good for everybody. And the other thing, by having less cars around, you could have what in many cities in New York and in smaller cities, you have cafes. You have tables and chairs outside of the, uh, out, uh, on the days when there is no market, outside of the, of the shops and, and people's sit there and enjoy each other. I mean, the plaza should be a center of, 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 of friendliness. And, and, and the fact that, that there is this market where everybody comes and meets each other, that, that's, it's, it's a meeting place for people. And we should treasure that. It, it, it's a wonderful feeling when, when people come around and talk to each other. So why don't we try to work together and have this as a big living room, a friendly place. And as a matter of fact, I remember when I had to unload uh, our car, there was a, a shopkeeper who was so nice and helped to unload and said, oh, we're so happy to have you. And so the shopkeepers could just open their windows, their doors a little sooner. And, uh, and, and so be in sync with the market and all the people that go to buy at the market, don't wait till 11 o'clock to open your shops. Open them at 8.30 or 9 o'clock. And that way you'll get more people coming to you. And, uh, you know, try to work together. And you'll win out in the end. Thank you. And you know, that young lady who was sitting over there, I wish she was uh, standing over there, I wish she was still here because, uh, you know, I know, she, I know she mentioned the youth of her community and I just want to mention the, uh, Councilman Gonzalez was really trying to champion a, a, a project on the plaza and hopefully we can find the funding to do that is in the evenings in the summer to host a jumble screen blow up TV that we could actually have movies on the plaza that would attract our youth to the plaza in the evenings. It would give them a place to go with them. I just want to share my experience with um, the farmer's market. When I was at the town hall, 
parking lot. Um, okay. I would come in, but it just, it didn't draw me. It just did not draw me. And as soon as they moved it to the plaza, I, I was there one time because we were vending. It was the Native Plant Society, and we were selling our little plants that we do once a year. But then I went to the, I went to the <coughs> farmer's market more this summer than I ever had. I love to go early in the morning and see the little grandmas with their cane and the grandkids carrying the bags and then just pointing what they wanted. And the kids would pick it up. I thought it was great. And it caused me to then walk around and see all the shops, whether they were open or not. And I did all of my Christmas shopping, although it isn't gigantic, I have a small family, in on the plaza, all of it. And I think that would not have happened if we hadn't moved the, the farmer's market onto the plaza. And it felt like it was home. It felt like it belonged there. Like it had been there before and it just came back. So that was my experience. I'm just curious what the process is going to be for the council to make this decision. Last year it was so contentious and it was, it was really quite disturbing. And, and difficult to sit through some of those meetings and have, you know, that we're yelling at each other and we're yelling at our community members and it just felt really not necessary. So I'm just wondering if we're gonna have to do that again this year or if we're gonna, how are we gonna come to this decision this year? Are we gonna need to do another petition? Are we gonna listen to the, to everybody? Or how is that gonna happen? Please. Mr. Bounce, you want to take that one on or you want to take that one? Hot topic subject. This is one of those things that, you know, you elected us to make a decision. And, we're, and that's why we're here tonight, to listen to you. You're all here. We're listening. We're getting ideas. How can we make it better or how can we not have it at all? How we need to move it someplace else. But, you know, there's, again, as... Commissioner Fandle, the council, we need to work together, the whole community. We've got to find ways to have our community come together. You know, we see two gentlemen sitting up here that were odds with each other. They come together, they found ways to come together to be, unite. The rest of us need to do that too, so there is a process. I'm gonna to go to uh, Councilman Pond. And so I got the big mouth, I'll take a shot. Uh, one of the reasons, one of the reasons um, uh, uh, Paul and Marco has kind of formed this partnership, when I understand it, uh, Paul and Tom's Farmers Market Inc. are going to just organize the farmers, and I believe they're going to ask, correct me if I'm wrong, Paul, to move the trucks out so we have more space. We've been kicking around the idea of having the chili line or some kind of other public transport run a circuit like every 10 minutes to bring people in from the lots to take people, uh, farmers back to their trucks, bring them in. We've shortened the time, the farmers are getting tighter. But what I'm really excited about is Comitas. Comitas not only is going to be working on grant writing, helping farmers to get our outreach and expand their, their products to communities outside of towns, but I believe, and correct me, both gentlemen, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm usually wrong about once a day, and more often than that, my wife tells me, but Marco, and his group, uh, Angelo uh, McCorse and others, are going to be working with the brick and mortar businesses to try and increase their sale. And so we've been thinking about, or I've been thinking a lot about, a real high-end, heavy-duty, top-notch, class AAA plus art store, where you walk in and the cheapest thing there is 5,000 bucks. How do you help that person make a sale? Well. You're not going to make a sale on Saturday morning with farmers and us going in to buy vegetables. But what you can do with proper outreach and some creative thinking, and someone like Marco or Comitas, Comitas trying to help, is to create that, that buy that happens over the holidays like Claudia was just talking about. You know, two years ago, my grandkids said, we never went to the plaza. We never went. Now, it's like a toss-up. Are we going to Fred Baca, the mountains, the plaza? And it's like, well, Grandpa, let's go to Fred Baca, and then let's go have hot chocolate down in the plaza. It's becoming their plaza again, and it's so exciting. But what I'm excited about is Palmitas actually reaching out to the businesses, 
making, you know, when we look at some of the pictures from last year, you couldn't see a lot of the brick and the mortar businesses behind the stall. That's a problem. So, uh, Comidas and TFMI, Taos Farmers Market, are going to collaborate to try and open those spaces up. Am I wrong on any of that? Yeah, you guys? did a great job. So, we, so if you look at uh, Fritz in your in your package here, we have we have it limited to four four trucks on the plaza. <laughs> Some of our bigger farmers, they absolutely need their trucks there because they have so much to sell and they need to keep it cool. But that's it. And it's only in locations where, where we're not putting, we don't want to put vehicles in front of businesses. They're going to be along the, uh, the Gorge restaurant. Right, right. Yeah. Oh, hi. I'm Kara Williams of Tulsa Mountain Outfitters. And I'm pretty much repeating now what everyone said. But our business had a terrific impact on the plaza. We adjusted our hours to be open at 8. And we had people in there shopping at 7.30. So if it comes to adjusting hours, since I'm probably the only morning person, we'll adjust it. <laughs> but, uh, and also, too, by the same question that Nina has, when will the decision be made on this? And, and what do we need to do? Because you know it's already the end of January. And we need to start planning. So, Rick, do we have that on our agenda? Uh, yes, it's on, on Tuesday to bring the calendar of events to the council uh, that you saw up there. <coughs> and with any additions we can get between now and then, uh, as well as the discussion item in regards to uh, farmers' market, whether that would be on the plaza. Real quick, um, I was wondering about the uh, the marketing and tourism director position and the planning. I, I didn't even know this that somebody was fired after four days or quit after four days. Could you just apprise us of what's going on with those two positions, Rick? Sure. Um, again, they're on the agenda for Tuesday to be discussed. We have some candidates to consider. Uh, I'm I'm not sure at this point whether we have a planning director or we don't. Uh, but we will talk about what the long-term options are for that in the organizing the department. And uh, again, there are candidates for both positions, and we'll present them to the council and see what they want to do. And, in fact, we have some local people that have expressed an interest that in the next day or two will be coming in with some applications. And, uh, people with strong backgrounds that know the community and that have heard the discussion and stepped forward. So I think the council has some good choices. Yeah. I'm going to change topic here for just a moment. Um, I'm sorry. <clears throat> I'm also getting over this cold. Uh, I'm Bo Alas. I own the Rocky Mountain Chocolate Factory on the uh, I have a, just a few slides here. Hope this opens up. Yeah. Uh, so I just wanted to address parking for a moment. Um, <clears throat> and I wanted to take a step back from the big picture where we're, we're concerned about the parking garage or, you know, find more parking spaces, things like that. Uh, I took a little time. We had a parking committee. We met a few times and we, uh, we have a question. Are you talking about generally or during the farmer's market? No, generally. Okay. Yeah, so this, I know we've been talking about the farmer's market a lot here, so I took a step back away from that for a moment. Uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, Summertime, we had some people meet for parking discussions, and uh, I also took some time to go putz around town and see what's uh, what things look like when it's busy or during the week. And um, I feel like there's something we could we could do, taking what we already have, and uh, and hopefully not spend too much money on it and make it possible. And uh, my my concern was that. Uh, in a lot of cases, people drive around and don't know where they're going when they're visiting town. And then locals also don't like to park and uh, cite the fact that it's, it's too far and they want to walk or things like that, or parking's not available. And uh, what I've noticed is that parking is there in most cases, but it's just not, it's not being filled. And uh, in my contention, what I think is going on here is that the parking that's available it's not visible, it's not comfortable. In some cases, it might not even be safe or not have the feeling of being safe. 
and uh, it's not pedestrian friend friendly. Um, and I, I really feel that if we make uh, make it enjoyable for people to walk, they will walk. Uh, we don't have to close the plaza now. We don't have to do things like that. Frankly, I think that uh, there are so few parking spaces on the plaza, you couldn't possibly be parking everybody there. They need to walk. So um, it'd be better just to get people to park, have them help them find it, and help them have a good time in the process of doing it. Um, the, the parking that we have that the town already leases is predominantly the town, the town hall lot and the Loretta lot. Um, the rest of it's, uh, I know it's not very easy to tell what's going on. The red circle is those. And um, the, uh, the other lots that are metered are peppered around, but there's a lot of stuff, a lot of places where people can park in those two lots. And I've walked around and I've noticed that they don't fill. There's, yes, they do fill during certain events, but there, there are um, many cases where they are not full, especially just in the summer. So um, my thoughts, um, and these are some thoughts that have also come from other people. So, um, first off, parking signage. Uh, it would be really helpful if we, the town owns the land way south of town. It should be possible to put some, some signs in that help people understand what they're, what, where they're going and not just have people arrive at the downtown area and not know where they're going. Um, and it should also be, possible to get a few more signs put up that help people understand, like for instance, the town hall lot. I don't think there's a, there's a free parking sign there that says that they're going. Um, and then uh, those kiosk maps, you've probably seen them, the freestanding things that, uh, that are for pedestrians. They're, they were a really nice investment, and I think we can, uh, we can use them to take it a step up for, for what we've got and make the maps that are on them more uh, more uh, localized to what's actually being seen right near them and oriented so that it's clearer for them to understand which way they're facing. Uh, right now the maps are, are north up and they're pretty blown out, like large, large area that they cover. Um, the, uh, the Loretto lot, I've been over there a few times at, at night too and I feel like it could be that what's going on is people don't like that lot. It just does not feel right. It's, uh, it's, it's kind of over-vegetated. At night, it only has a couple light posts in the whole thing. And, uh, and then when you have to leave that lot, you have no idea where you were going. There's a, there's a, you have to negotiate the crossing of Placitas, and then you have an unknown about where you are in the historic district. So. Um, the Placitas Drive crossing, I personally think that can use some work. It, uh, and it doesn't have to be anything complicated. In fact, I, I've heard the comment made that we should have one of those flashing sidewalk things where we push the button and the ground is flashing. And frankly, I think that would get destroyed in two years. Uh, it, it's a lot easier just to have maybe just a flashing light and a sidewalk sign and a raised sidewalk or something like that. Uh, and then the experience um, <clears throat> for people who are walking around, I think it can be, we can really make this experience for people who are coming to the downtown area enjoy that experience. And uh, it means letting them know where they are, but also giving them the appropriate signage that tells them, hey, you're here, or hey, you're entering the, the, the plaza now, or you're entering the John Dunn shops now or something that says, hey, the, the um, uh, you know, Bent Street's that way, or uh, Ledoux Street is across the road over there. And uh, my big thing from here, the welcome signs would be great, some sort of gateway thing would be wonderful, and I know it would cost money. Uh, a starting point might be to have posts a few, in a few key locations in the historic district that have arrows and say, that way to the plaza, that way to Vent Street, that way to Kit Carson Park, that kind of thing. So, um, and then just a, just a couple other ideas. Uh, I think it's possible to contact Google Maps and tell them, put our parking lots on your maps. And I think a lot of people who come into this town know to use their phone and to use their GPS and stuff, and, and if they can Google parking, and it shows up, it would help. 
So, uh, we don't even know our street names, right? Yeah, <laughs> okay. So, yeah, that's asking a lot from, from that. But, um, then, and then there's some other things in, in here that are uh, just, just like, you know, brainstorming. And I, I think that we could keep this dialogue going. But uh, um, having a simple map in Taos News, something that, that uh, could the visitor guides, so, so many people get that thing. Uh, it would be nice to have it there and have it paid maybe by the town. Um, and then uh, just some of the things that we're growing on here, like having, I mean, hey, what, what if we had a, um, a contest where an artist, the sculptors, could build a sculpture and we promised them a spot somewhere in the pedestrian area? And we, we install it for them and allow, allow like extra elements of coolness, house coolness to get put in to make the pedestrian experience more interesting for people. Uh, live performers, another one, you know, I, we've talked about a lot of these, but I, I think uh, uh, anything that we can do to make that experience, if somebody has to park their car over there, they're going to feel like it's worth their while to take some time and walk around. So, appreciate it. Thank you, guys.
there are some very, very serious things which we need to look at preserving in our area. Uh, I, I sit, I'm a member of the board of directors of the Northern Rio Grande National Heritage Area. I'm the Trevor Spouse and Santa and Rio Rio counties. And we always are mulling these kind of questions over in our, in our board meetings. We have people we associated with the National Park Service. We have the $400,000 to work with to kind of help you with know, grants and things like that, and local communities. But our primary goal is to somehow or other assure that what makes our area what it is is able to continue in an authentic way, drawing on the, on the old cultures, the traditions, taking the best of those, or the vitality of those, and extending those into the future as well. And so I just want to make these comments in general. Uh, I'm, I'm a writer. I'm, I'll certainly be writing a number of other articles and such on this in both English and Spanish. Uh, but I just want to make these uh, points. And I want to thank you guys for all that you do, and the council, and the commission, everybody who's here. And, uh, I know for my part, I'm willing to helping some of these initiatives. Uh, this idea of so not about a 1615 commemoration of the founding of Taos, for example. Well, you know, you can see how that might go. There's a lot of things that have happened since then in between 1680. This is just a very complicated story. It's a great story, a great drama. And uh, I think everybody in here is an active part of this ongoing story. And uh, I agree, uh, contentiousness should be set aside as far as possible. And some kind of a very good uh, framework, a uh, peaceable framework, should be set for carrying on this uh, excellence. Hello, my name is Maureen Cunningham. Um, I love, uh, I think that tonight, overwhelmingly, there's a, a sense that people want to feel uh, community in the farmer's market. They want a sense of being able to belong somewhere and have a market of place that's familiar to them in the community all the time. And uh, I think that the plaza captures that in a great deal. It does do a good job of embodying a sense of community in that area. But I also foresee, like some people, it's, it's hard to make everybody happy and uh, and hopefully one day the farmer's market will out, outgrow that area. Hopefully we'll have a very robust farmer's market. And uh, I like this young lady's idea right here about having an open field so close to town with ample parking. And uh, I just wanted to let her know or everybody know that I actually own part of that land and I think that was a fantastic idea. So <laughs> if anybody wants to facilitate discussion about that kind of thing, I'd be happy to exchange contact info or I want to say I'm really encouraged by this meeting. I love the emphasis on our traditional cultures, valuing history, people coming up with constructive ideas, and really trying to work together. I'm very proud of everybody at this meeting. It's wonderful. I'm going to slightly change the subject because I heard that we were going to talk about sewers. And um, they haven't come up. <laughs> so I'm just going to bring this up really quickly. I heard that there was some possibly funding to redo a lot of the sewers in the historic district, which are in terrible condition. And I want to ask uh, when that project is ready to go, or before it's ready to go, if you would please work with Kit Carson Electric. For many years, we hoped that the electric wires in the historic district would be buried. Uh, for aesthetic reasons, they are hideous. And this is our beautiful historic district, and we don't need all these electrical wires hanging around. And also, we have terrible electric service downtown. It's out all the time, and we have so many outages that I've had to install just recently a whole system because so many light bulbs burn out, and merchants can't afford to continue with license. And so, if, if indeed this sewer project is happening, let's only <coughs> So let's dig it up and do the sewers and the electric at the same time. We've had um, experiences in the past where we dug it up one year for the sewers and the next year for the electric and the next year again for the sewers. Let's not do that again. Let's get it really coordinated and make it gorgeous while we're at it. Thank you. Okay. Well, let's, let's take uh, this 
take a couple more and then we're gonna we're running a little short on time. So thank you. Uh, this is a great meeting. Uh, my name is Galmar Dowden. In uh, 1999, my wife and I assumed management of the Community Against Violence Craft Festivals. The uh, granddaddy of those was held on the plaza at that time. It's called the Taos Summer Arts and Crafts Fair. It had been hosted on the plaza at that time since 1993. I think that just about qualifies it as a historic use. Before the turn of the century, could I say. <laughs> 2014 was its first uh, time it was held in the park because craft fairs were removed from the plaza. Immediately afterwards, still in the same year, the Taos Farmers Market moved down to the plaza every weekend of the entire summer. The entire growing season, more than just the summer. Um, it was the merchants of the plaza who asked that to be removed and moved to the park, and they had they had good reasons and value for that, and I understood that. But one of my concerns is that between 1993 and 2008, there was a great symbiosis between the shops, the galleries on the plaza, and our arts in the craft fair. Many of them were local, and it was an important, important symbiosis. I can remember several times when excited artists came to me and told me that they sold seven pieces, eight pieces in one of the shops or that they'd been invited to begin showing their work on consignment. Around 2008, that dried up because of the change in the economy. The shops were struggling more. They couldn't go out and buy something from a local person. They had to buy something more reasonable somewhere else. Um, so, uh, One of, one of the things that, uh, that I wanted to bring to mind at this first point was a, uh, an artist named Lynn Bark. I don't know if any of you know Lynn. Uh, when we began organizing the fair, she was there. She was there for many years. And she still makes her art and still sells it. Recently, I was on my way to a wedding. I could buy something from, of hers from an airport in Albuquerque. Take it with me for a wedding. Um, that's one of the important things that the Plaza did when we had craft shows there. Is it incubated our local economy, local artists to grow their business beyond here. Now, if we have a farmers market, I see that there can be the same type of incubation for the farmer's market. However, what I do see is that the farmer's market has already far incubated itself beyond the limitations of that tiny plaza. We were welcome for so many years on the plaza because we confined everything we did to the curb of the interior of the plaza. I, I do not see any wisdom in me taking a three-year lease with the town to be on the plaza because you will not you will not want to be there shortly. It's too small. You could take that at the farmers market, put it in the parking lot across Camino de la Ocitas, talk to the Guadalupe Church, put it right there. You will accomplish everything you talk about accomplishing in your partnership with the businesses of the plaza. The charm of people coming downtown will be there, <coughs> add to it your, your transportation ideas around all the parking, because you're right, there's lots of parking both that's not used, and simply be used. I know because I was chasing my artists off the plaza every time they tried to leave their car there, hey, you can park right over here. You can park there, and they were there all day, and nobody bothered them. And, uh, one idea I have for you, Chief, is that we get rid of all our parking meters and 
That's them. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 it's you because you've got one guy on the scooter, you like to ride a motorcycle, it might be a three wheeler, with a little powder puff, and you pop the backs of the tires on everybody who's parked. And if you're there before more than two hours, three hours, whatever it is, then they get a ticket. These guys are sneaky. We, we did that talking. We've had a lot of people clean tires and we're Yeah, well, <laughs> those are the those are the employees downtown who need to stay there for eight hours. So that's something that the employers have to do. Right. But uh, anyway, I thank you very much for your time. I know it's getting late. Thank you. Now we're down in the downtown historic district. My name is Lynn Fitzgerald. I'm an uh, ex Main Street manager from Colorado and Arizona, and I worked for the town of Taos as a consultant on downtown historic district revitalization 2001 to 2006. So I just have some suggestions on a whole new area. Could the town create a downtown maintenance program with, along with a funding program so that you can take care of? Routine weed abatement, routine, routine sweep, street sweeping and sidewalk cleaning with blowers, routine street and sidewalk repairs, routine landscaping maintenance, example of the plaza and the alley project, routine plaster repairs on the plaza and the bunkos in the alley project, and historic district signage repairs, uh, et cetera, and actually maintenance is needed on the papers in the alley project. The sand is gone. It needs a specialized type of sand that needs to be refilled. And these are marvelous projects that are sort of, there was no maintenance program set up for them at the time. And they, every project you, you do in the historic district needs a maintenance program. Also, I would like to recommend the form formation of an organization similar to the Taos Project, which happened between 2000 and 2006. And this was, uh, Taos project and it had representation from all the historic districts being Ledoux, uh, Kit Carson Street, Paseo Pueblo Norte, which is definitely in the historic district, I hope you all remember. Uh, the Plaza, Guadalupe Plaza, that street, plus the town of Taos. Public Works Department would attend, other departments in the town of Taos, the Chamber of Commerce, UNM, and other stakeholders with interest in the historic district. Attendance was very meeting to meeting. But information and uh, involvement came in from each representative of those districts, and they had a chance to be whole, heard. The whole historic district was informed and involved in this process. The economy was different, yes, of course, but many things were accomplished at that time, and it was an exciting and positive time for the people involved. I think it'd be very helpful to have such a group be reactivated. Thank you. Thank you. If it's okay with council, since it's late, and I think we originally had this is six to eight, um, the, uh, we, we have already had a discussion and some joint work sessions. No, I was just going to suggest to you that we hold another meeting like this, continue the process in probably another three weeks or so. Yeah. That sounds good to everybody. In, in two or three weeks, we'll hold another meeting like this to finish off the uh, do a status report on what's above and finish off the subjects remaining on the agenda. And Council Ms. Farrell was suggesting that. Sounds good to everybody. And yeah. we all actually get home to a reasonable hour. I think we've got a lot to digest. And again, and, and we've recorded this, so if anybody, I think there's been some fantastic ideas and uh, days left, but if we get a copy of the PowerPoint. Um, and we'll try to put this all together for the Council to look at. Anybody else wants a copy of the DVD, we'll make that available. And as well as the survey, we'll try to post as much of this online as possible, including the suggested grants. So again, thanks everybody for coming. Great opportunity to hear from you. Great opportunity for all of us to work together. Thank you and have a good night.